Testing one, testing two, testing three. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Here we are for the Chippendales episode of Stranger Days. Let's, uh, <sighs> let's get into it. When we think of erotica, before the age of the internet at least, we generally tend to think about Playboy, or Penthouse, or maybe even those steamy novellas sold at grocery stores for the lonely housewife looking to fantasize about Fabio pile-driving them in the backseat of a Volkswagen or something. No matter how you slice it, sex sells. Men have strip clubs, or gentlemen's clubs, to make it sound less like a place where dudes walk out with soaked underwear, this happens more times than they'd like to admit. But women, on the other hand, they've only had a few options, and before the late 1970s, they didn't really have anything at all. But that was about to change when Soman Banerjee and Paul Snyder launched the all-male performing show, Chippendales. This touring show of male exotic dancers was an immediate smash hit. But greed, lust for power, and assassination, and several attempted killings later, the story of Chippendales is anything but arousing. My name is Matt Jarbo, and this is Stranger Days. Soman Banerjee, or Steve as he liked to be called, was born October 8, 1946 in Bombay, India and was an American Indian entrepreneur. This came after operating a mobile gas station and a failed backgammon club, but you know, entrepreneurs are always going to find a way to succeed any way that they can and Banerjee bought a failed Los Angeles nightclub called Destiny 2 in 1975 and he took that and he turned it into a nightclub that featured female mud wrestling and a female exotic dancing night. Clearly, Steve here thought that sex sells, but the club wasn't as successful as he wanted it to be. So in 1979, he renamed the club Chippendales and launched the first ever male exotic dance night for ladies only. The funny thing about the name Chippendales was actually because Banerjee's lawyer at the time recommended it due to the current furniture style in the club. Yes, Chippendale style is a real thing, and here's a bit of history for you. Thomas Chippendale was born in Oatley in West Riding of Yorkshire, England back in June 1718. He became a cabinet maker in London designing furniture in the mid-Georgian English Rococo, Rococo Yes, Chippendale style is a real thing. Thomas Chippendale was born in England in June of 1718. He grew up to become a cabinet maker in London, designing furniture in the mid-Georgian and neoclassical styles. However, he wasn't just a cabinet maker, he was also an interior designer. And now his name is associated with male erotica. When Chippendales launched, it was an immediate success. I'm talking about the club drawing overflow crowds of women who, for just $20 admission, could ogle and kiss sweaty, tanned, well-muscled young men in G-strings. So many women flocked to see them that the city fire authorities wanted to close the place down for overcrowding. But like I said, nothing ever stays good forever. And in fact, within a year of opening of Chippendales, Co-founder Paul Snyder and his estranged wife Dorothy Stratton were both dead, by Paul's hands no less. And I feel that Paul's life and ultimate death is a fascinating side story to this whole affair. What you need to know about Paul Snyder was that he was a Canadian pimp. And I'm not making that up. He actually did meet young women and pimp them out when he was working in Vancouver, British Columbia. And this is what he was doing when he met a young teenager named Dorothy Stratton while she was serving ice cream at a Dairy Queen in Vancouver. When she caught his eye, you see, Paul already had dreams of Hollywood fame, and he saw Dorothy here as his meal ticket. This was 1978, and at the time, those who knew them did say that Snyder saw an opportunity in Dorothy 
and he began grooming her at the time. Eventually, he persuaded her to pose nude for a photo shoot, which then was sent to Los Angeles and launched her photo career with Playboy. Over the next two years, the feather-haired blonde girl next door became a Playboy Playmate of the Year, with a budding acting career to boot. Paul, on the other hand, was unable to earn any money in America because he didn't have a work visa, so he resorted to several get-rich-quick schemes. And eventually, their relationship strained to the point where Stratton had begun an affair with Peter Bogdanovich, who was the director of the movie that was supposed to be her big break. And while she did try to end things amicably with Paul, Paul didn't see it that way. And after a confrontation, and this is true, he killed her by shooting her in the face with a shotgun. Then he sexually assaulted her corpse before turning the same shotgun on himself. She was only 20 years old when she died. Now, I've heard and read different accounts of this story. They all end the same way. But what I had heard was that not only did Paul sexually assault Dorothy before killing her, that he did continue to sexually assault her body before killing himself. Hugh Hefner did chime in at one point about this, and he said that this was Paul's way of making sure that no one else could have her. And this really did tear a large hole in not only Hef, but Peter Bogdanovich himself. Because here's an interesting bit of side trivia when it comes to the death of Dorothy. Peter was so distraught after the death of Dorothy that he actually started taking care of her family in British Columbia. It was here that he met her younger sister, Louise Stratton, and they ended up getting married eight years after Dorothy was killed. They ultimately got a divorce in 2014 and they've remained close ever since, but it's just interesting that this was the only good thing to come out of Dorothy's involvement in the entirety of Chippendales. With the exception of one thing, and it's kind of minor, but not really, she was also the one that suggested that all the dancers wear the bow tie and cuffs. The iconic look of Chippendales actually came from a Playboy Playmate, which, if you start to think about it, they both share very similar designs, and in fact, They've gone to court over this before. But anyway, this isn't a story about how Chippendales became Chippendales. This is a story that gets pretty dark. Now, you'd figure with that first tragic event having happened, it would have at least opened the public's eyes to the type of people who were running Chippendales. But it didn't. In fact, the franchise simply kept on growing. And this is where Steve Banerjee met choreographer Nick DeNoya. Now, Nick here was born on May 14th, 1941, and he was professionally known as Nick DeNoia, and he was an American director and choreographer known for his work as the original choreographer of the Chippendales dance troupe, and for, and this is true, his Unicorn Tales sh short films for young audiences, for which he actually won two Emmys. So this guy not only produced you know, female erotica, or male erotica, really. He produced award-winning shorts for children. It's amazing how there's a lot of that overlap in Hollywood. Not saying anything, but, you know, take it for what you will. Now, Denoya here was actually really, really, really popular, right? He created all this stuff. He was very charismatic about it. And that attitude put him at the front and center of the business. In fact, more people associated Nick here than Steve as being the person behind Chippendales. And when it came to business, both Steve and Nick, they feuded like crazy over money and control. And this is actually where Nicholas here proposed a deal in which he would then move out of LA. He would take the show to New York and then keep half of the revenue. And yeah, there was a little bit more too. According to the podcast, Welcome to Your Fantasy, this is what they said when talking about the subject of Nick and Steve Steele. They said, 
Nick wrote on a napkin that he has the right to take Chippendales on the road and own it in perpetuity. Steve signed it and gave away the most profitable part of the business because he did not know what perpetuity meant. Over the next few years, Chippendales made millions and charismatic Danoa received all of the acclaim, celebrated by people like Sally Jesse Raphael and Phil Donahue. Meanwhile, Steve felt deeply scorned. I believe the words you want to use here are fucking pissed because what he created, what he popularized, was basically devoid of his name. You can start to see where jealousy and anger would come into play, but not only that, Banerjee was facing some serious financial stress. He had mounting back taxes, a $70,000 reprint fee due to a Chippendales calendar error. Each month had about 31 days from what I'm reading here and a lawsuit from Nicholas Denoya after Banerjee sent out his own Chippendales touring company. So even though they kind of co-owned the name, Nick really owned the brand. One way or another, Nick here really owned the brand. And as a result of that, Banerjee thought, well, this is my name, my company. And he sent out his own competing Chippendales, which at that point causes market confusion. And yeah, Denoya here sent uh, basically a cease and desist. So you can kind of see where this is going. It was about at this point that Stephen here felt that he needed to remove Nick from the equation permanently. This is when he turned to his Bronx born friend, Ray Colon, that's his name, Ray Colon, and asked him to put a hit on his former business partner. Stupidly though, and this is kind of how Steve Banerjee was kind of stupid. He thought that because Ray was from the Bronx, that Ray was mobbed up, that he was a mafioso type. The truth of the matter is Ray wasn't. He was a failed police deputy and a failed entrepreneur in his own right. And so what he did is he hired a junkie named Louie to take out the hit. So in 1987, in the middle of the day, Louie just strolled into Denoya's midtown office and shot him right in the face with a large caliber pistol while Nick sat at his desk. That is ballsy, it's brash, and it absolutely sends a message. But the police investigation went nowhere. They had no leads, they had nothing, it went nowhere. And in 1988, Denoya's family ultimately sold his share of Chippendales back to Steve Banerjee for $1.3 million. And it was estimated that the value of the business at the time was worth 10 times what Banerjee was able to buy back from. You figure any rational criminal at this point in time would take this win and would just move on with their life. Keep acting on like nothing happened. Don't draw attention to yourself. And eventually it will all go away. But like I said, Steve Banerjee was kind of dumb and he got pretty emboldened. In fact, at this point, he really wanted to keep his iron fist on the male strip club world. He didn't want anyone else moving in on his action. Now, by this time, there were actually lots of copycats trying to capitalize on the craze. Let's be real here. Women like porn. They've always liked porn. They continue to this day to like porn. This was porn for women. It wasn't always going to be cornered to one side of the market. This was going to blow up like freaking the internet did. You know what I mean? Anyway, at this point, there was a lot of competition. And there was one in particular that caught Banerjee's eyes. And this was a company called Adonis. It was an American registered company, which contained several ex Chippendale dancers and was concentrating its operations on Britain. So it was out of the United States. It was trying to operate overseas, thinking that they wouldn't in any way be involved with Chippendales in the United States or Banerjee or whatever. Well, Steve, again, if you look at this image of Steve, this is him acting like a pimp, sitting there at his bar, got a drink, got a smoke, 
got a stacked gentleman behind him. This is a promotional photo. And at the time, the Chippendales, I guess you could say business, had acquired a reputation for playing hardball to the point where Adonis complained to the Office of Fair Trading that the company was demanding contracts from venues which banned other groups from performing there for a year. So they were trying to undercut all the competition by signing these clubs to an exclusive one-year contract. I mean, this would really hurt a lot of other places, but you can kind of see why they would do it. Not only that, but a New Mexico disc jockey thought that it would be amusing to get together some overweight, eh, semi-naked dancers, a group of about uh, 16 fat people that called themselves the Chunkendales, and he wanted to put them together for a bit of a gag. Well, he actually ended up getting a cease and desist letter from Banerjee. That is basically where this guy was at the time. He wasn't going to fuck around with any of this. And when it came to controlling the brand and the intellectual property, again, that iron fist was going to come out. And since he had already had that big win by getting completely away scot-free with the murder of Nick, he thought, well, I can do it again. So it was at this point in time where he reached out to Ray Colon to put out another hit on the Adonis choreographer and a dancer. Now, according to a 1993 article in The Independent, this is ultimately how it all played out. In July 1991, the FBI was approached by a man named Lynn Bressler, who was offering his services as an informant. Bressler told the agency that he had been hired as a hitman by an individual named Roy Colon in Los Angeles. Colin had asked him to travel to Britain and kill two members of Adonis who were performing at the Winter Gardens in Blackpool. The intended targets were Steve White, Adonis's Australian business manager, and Reed Scott, a former Chippendale employee who was one of its masters of ceremonies. The fee was to be $25,000 a head, although Colin later says he wouldn't be too bothered if someone else was killed instead of Reed Scott. White, on the other hand, whom Colin dubbed the Snowman, was the one he really wanted dead. Now, Bresso described, much to the FBI's amazement, how he went to Ray Colin's $350,000 house in a uh, very prosperous LA neighborhood, by the way, where Colin fetched a canvas bag from his garage. It was marked with a skull and crossbones, and it contained, as detectives later discovered, enough cyanide to kill at least 2,300 people. Bressler was given an eyedrop bottle containing a small quantity of the poison, and Colin decided that the best way to carry out these murders was to inject them directly with the poison. So on July 12th, 1991, Ray Colin drove Bressler to the LA airport to board a Virgin Atlantic flight to London. Bressler had been furnished with about 1200 bucks in travel expenses. His code name was Strawberry for some reason. And his instructions were that after the murderers had been carried out, that he was to telephone Colin and say cryptically, I signed up that draft choice from the South. Now, here's the thing. Bressler was a previous informant for the DEA. And he later claimed that he believed that the whole escapade at first was a joke. He thought the whole thing just was, you know, ah, we're having a little bit of fun here, but decided to inform the U.S. authorities once he realized that this was actually a real thing. And when he got to Britain, he actually did that right away. It was 10 days later, however, that FBI special agent Dan West was sitting in an office in Las Vegas, Nevada, bugging a transatlantic telephone conversation between Colin and Bressler. As the conversation progressed, the two men were discussing how to carry out the hit, and Colin suggested that Bressler should hit the victims on the head with a brick or a hammer, something nice and fast that would neutralize the situation before injecting them in the neck with cyanide. I mean, wouldn't the autopsy discover the cyanide in the system if that was what was going to be to kill him if they're hitting the head with a brick you could kill him that way and then you wouldn't need the cyanide. it just seems so stupid so over the top 
so much like someone who believed that they were a mafioso person rather than an actual competent individual. But with this information, that actually led the FBI to arrest Ray, who then, you know what, he rolled over on his buddy Steve, sang like a stool pigeon on, on Steve. And then in 1993, Steve Banerjee was arrested at his LA office. And the following year, and this is where it gets interesting, the following year, in 1994, a federal prosecutor charged Stephen Banerjee with racketeering, attempted arson, and the murder of his former partner, Nick DeNoya. He was denied bail because according to witness testimony, Banerjee said that he planned to hire a private pilot and pay them $25,000 to fly him to India without a passport, where he'd get a new wife and kids. And he also says that he would commit suicide if he were arrested again. Now, before pleading guilty to racketeering, attempted arson, and murder for hire, he transferred all of his possessions to his wife. They soon divorced, and she sold Chippendales, and then he pled guilty to the charge and arranged a plea bargain with the federal court. Steve is was at least smart enough to know that he was pretty screwed. He was pretty, he was, he was pretty much done. So at least he was able to give his wife all the money because he would never be able to spend it again. But he actually had other plans in mind because he was never officially sentenced for his crimes at all. Simply hours before his sentencing hearing, he committed suicide in a Los Angeles jail cell. He hung himself with his prison bedsheet and was found dead at about four o'clock in the morning the day of his sentencing hearing. He was going to only get about 26 years in prison, but he just chose the easy way out. And that brings us to the end here of the Chippendales origins, the tragic history of this whole damn situation. Steve Banerjee was almost 50 years old when he was arrested and incarcerated. And he would have not been any more than I think 75 by the time he got out. That's probably why he killed himself. He was an idiot, he was a coward, and he thought he was a kingpin. And Chippendales has lived on past this, by the way. They've become only more popular and they still operate even during the pandemic. However, not directly. If you want to get a Chippendales dance, you can find them on Cameo, as I found out. So that might be a little bit of information there for you ladies who might be looking for a little bit of spice in your life. For you fellas, well, this is just, a, <laughs> I guess you could say a tale of caution. Always be wary of the guys who <laughs> run male strip clubs. They'd be crazy. Anyway, as always, I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear your impressions on the story. Let me know down in the comment section. If you guys want, please uh, leave a like and a comment and subscribe. If you're listening to this podcast on iTunes or anywhere else, please leave a review. And if you really want to help support the channel, and I hope you would, please feel free to check out patreon.com forward slash Matt Jarbo. A couple bucks helps me keep on doing this show, and it's a lot of fun. And if you have anything you want to suggest to yourself, be sure to find me and let me know on social media. I'll talk to you guys later. Have yourself a great day. Thank you for listening and peace out.